Okay, and we are live. Good day, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us once again for the Shangsheng Institute School of Tibetan Medicine webinar series, uh, where we uh, talk about um, public health and uh, traditional medicine uh, topics and theory and practice uh, from the perspective of our various uh, special guests and uh, with the perspective of traditional Tibetan medicine. So today we're going to be discussing the uh, Chinese medicine theory of ministerial fire. Um, the ministerial fire is an ancient elemental theory uh, which describes the energetic dynamic of human physiology and also relates with the macrocosmic uh, systems of our natural world. Um, so this is a very profound and fundamental aspect of theory with a lot of insightful applications. So today we're welcoming our very special guest, uh, Zev Rosenberg, a uh, acclaimed practitioner and teacher of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, Zev has published uh, multiple books and uh, lectures very widely uh, and is a pivotal uh, member of the, uh, of the uh, global Chinese medicine community. We're really honored to, uh, to have Dr. Zev here with us today. Also, we have our special guest, Dr. Ann Shelton Krut. Uh, Dr. Krut is a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine, and also a practitioner of uh, Chinese pole star astrology, a very classical system of Taoist astrology. So thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Ann. As always, we have our ongoing webinar host, Menba Punsak Wangmo, the uh, director of the Shangsheng School of Tibetan Medicine, a teacher and practitioner of Tibetan medicine with over 30 years of experience teaching and practicing uh, all around the world. Thank you so much for leading our webinar uh, again, Menba Punsak Wangmo. Thank you. And my name is Adam Okerblom. I'm an alumni uh, and a uh, board of directors member at the Shangsheng School of Tibetan Medicine and uh, joining you here from uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, California. So all of our guests, thank you so much for joining us. And um, what uh, if you've tuned into our show before, you know that we're going to have some presentation uh, with our special guests and some discussion. And then after a while, towards the end, we're going to click on we're going to click off Facebook and have a live Q&A with all of your guys' questions. So save your questions and um, get ready to raise your hand later on and ask our guests. But until then, uh, as Nathan mentioned, please do remember to keep your microphone muted at all times. Um, before we start, I just want to remind you guys a couple of exciting upcoming programs with the Shangsheng School of Tibetan Medicine. Um, most of you are already part of our online learning community, but if uh, anybody isn't, please do uh, stay in touch with us uh, by joining our online community at community.tibetanmedicineschool.org. We post the links and the community and discussion for all of our programs. Coming up pretty soon, next weekend, we have a short program um, that uh, I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be called External Observations in Tibetan Medicine with our director and head teacher, Menpa Punsak Wangmo. It's still open for registration, so please check that out. And then later on at the end of May, we have a very special guest helping us out with a short course. We're gonna be discussing the healing science of mental wellness in Tibetan medicine. Uh, with uh, our, our director, Menpa Punsak Wangmo, and a very special guest who we've seen on our show before, uh, the famous Zigar Kongchul Rinpoche. So that's going to be a fabulous discussion as well. All right. Again, thank you guys uh, all for tuning in. So here we are. Excellent. So Zev, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk. How's everything going uh, in your neck of the woods down there in Southern California? Well, it's as dry as a bone down here for the third year in a row. And that's one of the things I wanted to discuss with you all today is the uh, climate change, ecological issues, and ministerial fire as a, an ecological problem because the earth also has sovereign fire, ministerial fire as well. So that's probably the main point I'm trying to get across in this new book called Afterglow. Absolutely. And we really appreciate you sharing some tidbits from your new book that's coming out soon. Um, Dr. Zeb, before we uh, launch into your presentation, I wanted to ask you a preliminary question, which I also uh, want to ask uh, Menpa Wangmo uh, in a little while. And it really is a point that connects all of, you know, the, that's common to the classical systems of medicine in Asian medicine and around the world, Chinese and Tibetan medicine, both have in common a very strong emphasis on classical texts, 
Uh, in Tibetan medicine, we have the Gyuji, the classical four tantras, pivotal foundation of study. And I know that your work and what you're talking about today is very much rooted in the classical texts of Chinese medicine. So can you get the ball rolling by just telling us just a little bit about some of the most important texts that you're working with and why is it so crucial that we rely on the classical texts in this day and age, sometimes thousands of years later on? Okay, the first point, um here is um, that there's a vast misunderstanding of classical texts. And I, I hope that name dropping doesn't get me in trouble, but um, I went to see a lecture by Deepak Chopra, who I've known for many years. You know, He was based here in uh, San Diego for many years. And when I first moved to San Diego 32 years ago, I actually tried to get a position at his institute there. And I asked him a question at the end of a lecture at UC San Diego, and I said, well, uh, what role do you see, you know, uh, the uh, Paraka Samhita, and Anne's going to have to correct me on my pronunciations of the, of the Ayurvedic classical texts um, in, in, in modern uh, so-called alternative medicine and the medicine that you teach. And he was actually very perplexed at the question. He said that, he didn't see much of a role for the classical Ayurvedic texts in modern practice, which was very disappointing for me because um, really this whole thing of modernism in medicine and the latest research and the latest, all that is very useful and very valuable, but it forgets something very important, what we call in Chinese li lun or principle. Principles are reflect the timeless and do not change. So the authors of the Han Dynasty texts, the authors of the classical medical texts of Tibet and India were looking at the primordial forces of the universe using, of course, there are cultural and linguistic uh, aspects to that. But nonetheless, the principles of yin and yang, wuxing five phase, tridosha, seasonal chi, these are universal principles. The world may have changed greatly in the last 2000 years, but the sun still rises in the east in the morning and sets in the west in the evening. The moon still revolves in specific cycles around the earth. The human form is basically the same, you know, same number of fingers more or less on our hands and sense organs and limbs, there is a form to human life. And this has not changed basically. And therefore, when we look at these principles, they can easily be applied to present day health problems. In fact, they do a much better job of doing that, in my opinion, in terms of our own practices of Tibetan Chinese Ayurvedic medicine, than trying to quote unquote, uh, uh, westernize, Europeanize, um, the practice and the theory itself, that somehow it, it's not legit unless it reflects a biomedical mindset. So that's the first thing. So that's, that's and that's where I begin from the very beginning. You now I taught at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine I was a department chair there for 23 years. And at the very beginning, I was trying to tackle, to immerse myself in the then a uh, very thin material that was available to understand health problems. I wasn't trying to just mimic Western medicine. Western medicine is internally consistent in terms of its praxis, its theory, and the way that it looks at the human entity. There's a particular worldview behind it. And the end result of that worldview is a disease model based on morphological changes to tissues and use of specific drugs to treat those problems, surgeries and other procedures. Measuring quantitative aspects such as blood pressure, um, contents of different cells, uh, white blood cells, et cetera, et cetera. And it's valuable for that, but that's not what we are, in my opinion, are here to do. And I've seen it over and over again because I've had several students here in uh, San Diego who are, were at Pacific College when I was teaching there. 
And they've come to the conclusion through their own practices, almost in spite of the uh, biomedical bias of the training, that when they study and research the classical methods of medicine and apply them, that their results are much, much better in clinic. Okay, so you want me to do like a like some slides presentation, or I, or I can take questions, or you can guide me, Adam or Anne, with uh, some specific topics. I, I would actually prefer that in this type of a setup, you know, sure. a seminar, so to speak. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Zeb. So <clears throat> let's just kind of do a few questions, and whenever you feel is a good time to launch into any slides or materials you have, then just go on ahead and and click on. And uh, as as always, a very long-standing tradition of our webinar series is if I ask a question and you want to talk about something completely different, you just go right on ahead and launch right into that. Well, so. I'm notorious for rambling, so I'm actually going to hem myself in on that one. So, All right. So the traditional systems of, of Asian medicine, you know, Ayurveda, Tibetan, Chinese medicine, there's one thing that's very common is, or, or common between them, is that we have a fundamental theory that's based on observation of natural cycles, natural laws of our greater world, and then how that relates with our internal condition of human anatomy, physiology. How is our health connected to the greater world? And um, in my studies of Chinese medicine, I found the connection and articulation of this kind of worldview to be incredibly rich and beautiful and inspiring. So can you start by just telling us a little bit about kind of the basic theory of how in Chinese medicine, how do we view the connection between the human health and the human dimension and the greater macrocosmic world or the greater universe? Well, of course, nearly all of the theory is based on that relationship. and. Um... So I'm going to try to find the slide here for you. So, um, the Chinese physicians basically observed nature and natural cycles and then saw the human being, the human entity, as an expression of heaven and earth. The Han dynasty physicians and philosophers saw the human being as a conduit between heaven and earth. And that our behavior, since we, have free, we are free-willed beings, determines the health of the planet and of the universe itself, because everything in this universe is interconnected. So you could say that the classical texts are a guidebook of, first of all, how to live I, using the principles of yang sheng, nourishing life, which go back pre-Han to the Ma Wang Dui manuscripts that are, have been translated by Don, Donald Harper, to um, living a lifestyle that promotes longevity and health. And this is in all medical traditions. For example, the great Jewish physician, uh, Maimonides or the Rambam and Ibn Sina, the great Persian physician, both taught that if you follow the laws that I set out in my books, you will never get sick unless visited by famine, war, catastrophe, or problems of, of course, uh, constitution. So it is possible to maintain great health throughout one's life. And we spend so much capital, so much money and resources on treating diseases that could have been prevented, that preventative medicine has to be the first concern of all medicine. In biomedicine, preventative medicine means getting tests. And of course, these things are very valuable. You can stop disease processes earlier on and save life. But we go a little further in terms of how to maintain health in the first place so that one never has to deal with such horrific diseases that we see ravaging our societies today. And this is a great time to be discussing these issues because right now, um, I, I hesitate to say post-pandemic, let's hope it's post-pandemic and that uh, COVID goes endemic. But um, there's been a lot of psychological, emotional damage 
you know, the isolation, the loss of loved ones, one's personal illness, post-COVID syndromes. Um, so, this, you know, we have a lot of work to do. I would say a majority of the treatment I'm doing now in my practice is not treating specific diseases or conditions like low back pain, irregular menstrual cycles, although of course I still work with those things, but that I've moved since the pandemic started to a larger context, which is how to repair the body, mind, organism complex as a whole, and then using the tools of our medicine to do that. And it also seems what people want. They wanna have a place, a space, an environment where they can be recalibrated, so to speak. You know, the acupuncture needles specifically allow the body and the mind to tune in to natural cycles, circadian rhythms, lunar, solar, seasonal cycles, rather than always being governed by digital time and by clocks and watches. And of course, right now we're dealing with the debate over, um, you know, time change here in the United States. Should we? Um, Daylight savings. Have, Right, you know, and the rate of uh, heart attacks and other illnesses goes up for 10 days after the springtime change. When you force the clocks ahead and all of a sudden you're wait, you know, gradually the days were getting longer and you were waking up with more light in the morning. And now you've been thrust back into waking up before the sun rises. This is the problem with me and it's actually caused me a little bit of disorientation. So now the Congress has passed a bill to make it permanent daylight saving times. And, and uh, John Coco and I were talking about this is that, you know, there's an article in the New York Times a few days ago and they're saying that most circadian rhythm scientists agree that we should go to standard time, which is more closely based on natural daylight nighttime rhythms than daylight saving times. We're just trying to cheat by making the day longer at the end, but making it you know, darker at the beginning. So we're playing with that yin-yang balance of daytime, nighttime, and the seasonal rhythms that the Neijing speaks about. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's, it's really fascinating that, you know, we have this kind of uh, social political situation where, you know, like they can vote to manipulate the, the hours of the day and that sort of thing. And um, it seems a little bit scary because those people are, are certainly not uh, coming from a basis of uh, this kind of, um, you know, organic, natural, holistic health kind of cycle with human beings, healthy circadian rhythm, with the healthy flow of season. Um, so it's really interesting. I wish that you could be on their board of directors to help decide those things personally. Problem is once you get on those things that uh, you're playing, with politics, which tends to corrupt everything it touches, I'm sorry to say. So I will so, pass on that offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so this brings up a lot of really interesting stuff. And um, uh, pretty soon I'd like to circle back to uh, Menpa Wangmo regarding this issue of, of season and time and, and um, natural cycles. But first I wanna ask you one more question because it brings up this balance of, of yin and yang, working with the cycles of, of daytime, nighttime, the seasons in Chinese medicine, this is fundamental to the balance of energies dynamic in the human health, which we articulate as yin and yang. And those balances need to be in a dynamic interaction. But as I understand uh, the, you know, one major, um, expression of disease and imbalance is actually when those two are not interacting. And I think you deal, I've heard you teach about this, and I think you deal with this in your new book. So can you comment on how the separation of yin and yang, the no longer being in that dynamic interaction is, is kind of the, um, uh, the cause of disease in, in humans? Can you talk about the separation of yin and yang? And we could also look at that in terms of autoimmunity. Again, these are fairly complex topics. And um, but I'm going to try to find, let me find my uh, Jui Yin chart. So one second here, Jui Yin. Hmm. Here we go. So let me get this on screen. 
Can everybody see that? Okay. Let me... Can it maximize? Or is that as long? I'm, I'm going to try to get it full screen. Just give me one second here. Take your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a little longer than I expect. Let's see. So, how do you do a full screen? One second. Is it that green button? It's not right fitting there? the screen. Let's see. Uh, sorry about that. That's uh, it's kind of. Let's see. Let's let's do it. Let's let's use this one second. Seventy five percent. That should do it. There we go. Is that still visible to everybody? It just got smaller. Yeah, but now you can see the full screen on the. Uh, presentation here. So anyway, um, the in the Shang Han Lun, there are six stages of illness, three yang, three in stages. And um, the joy can be translated as reverting. So on one hand, this can be related to counterflow of yang going up, literally ministerial fire and yin sinking, yin and yang separating with loss of communication with the middle burner, the spleen chi. And um, when this happens, um, you lose the ability to assimilate food. The separation of clear and turbid from what you're eating doesn't happen. There's diarrhea, there's Ministerial fire harasses the upper burner, gets blocked in the upper burner, harasses the heart. And then you get agitation, you get dry mouth, unquenchable thirst. So it's a health pattern, but it also um, reflects what's going on in the world around us as well. And um, let's see. Nature of, let me go to the bottom part of the chart here. You can see here. So the internal space, which is the yin domain, houses the ministerial fire below. So it's one solid line, dragon fire within water, which is the, which is associated with Khan. And this is the ministerial fire, fire within water. This is the ministerial fire that's stored in the water of the kidneys in the lower burner. In the upper burner, you have water within fire, which is the heart, which is the sovereign fire, which is associated with illumination, consciousness. And they are constantly communicating and balancing each other. And of course, uh, the heart fire is associated with Shaoyan. So in the Shang Han Lun, many of these patterns of illness are in Shaoyan disease and in Zhuoyan disease. So um, when this internal space becomes filled with yin and cold, it forces the fire up to the upper part of the body. And this leads the interior of the body cold. Okay, so that's where um, Zhuoyan disease, that's a short, uh, Cliff Notes version of Dwayne disease. But now I'd like to take it to more of an environmental aspect. And if anybody needs me to stop and explain along the way, because this is a fairly complex material. And while I'm in the book, I think we've succeeded you know, with Anne's help in editing in making it very simple and very clear. In a presentation, it's more of a difficult situation to do so. Well, we'll have our Q&A at the end so people can save their questions. Okay, so um, let's use this chart now. So, what we call autoimmune disorders, and this can be anything from allergies to uh, cancers to blood diseases such as lupus, is where the body-mind intelligence attacks itself. And that the very forces which in Chinese medicine are, I'll put this in the chat, um, 
Where is the chat here? Rape chi or defense chi or ying chi or construction nutritive chi. You see that in the Ling Shu, Su Wen, Nanjing, Shang Han Lun, this interaction of Wei Qi, Defense Qi, and Ying Qi is one of the most essential principles and forces that maintain our health. According to Li Dong Yuan, that when the spleen Qi, the spleen stomach Qi is weakened and decrepit, the spleen Qi helps raise and lift the defense Qi out to the exterior to protect the body. But when the interior yin domain of the body is weakened, it can collapse back in and cause internal heat to simmer and start to have destructive effects on the internal body, which in modern medicine is often considered to be inflammation. So inflammation is actually the ministerial fire's attempt to expel cold evil, damp evil that has situated itself inside the body. So for example, if yin chi is accumulating in the channels, the joints in terms of the acupuncture channels are nodes and they're like switch points. So if there is congestion and blockage by cold or yin evil, damp evil, the body's ministerial fire will attempt to burn it off. So this inflammation is actually the body mind's unsuccessful attempt to expel this cold and damp. And if it doesn't succeed, it actually ends up damaging the organism. So, um, so, here, let's look at this quote here. When one's intentions follow the orders of the Tao and in addition emphasize calmness, the movements of the five fires in the organism will remain constrained and the ministerial fire will have no other function than to benefit creation and transformation, therefore unendingly securing the engendering of life. And when this happens, it cannot consume what we call the yuan chi, the source chi of the body. But if the fires of the emotions are stirred, if we lose our center, if the emotions become excessive, they will stir this fire more and it starts to consume the organism. So here we're seeing the importance of maintaining emotional equanimity in terms of maintaining our health as well. Okay, um, ask him questions on that, because again, everything I'm mentioning here is a huge, huge subject in and of itself. So um, That's incredible. That's, you know, that, that view of how autoimmune conditions and inflammatory conditions can, are related with those internal and external manifestations of, of fire and the dynamic of fire and water. <clears throat> it's a fascinating science. And these kind of health issues, autoimmune conditions, inflammatory conditions are, you know, I don't want to say ubiquitous, but they're very common in modern society. It's a major issue and Western medicine treatments are very often insufficient or problematic and not really cutting it. So not only is this kind of theory absolutely fascinating, but it has this really useful uh, application as well. I see I that Peter raised his hand here, Adam, so you may want to take his question. Oh, Peter, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, please do. Let's see. How do I, how do I call on you? Um, there we go. Oh, there I'm, we are. I'm, I'm not going to be, although I, I so thank you for doing this. I think this is a, a, a vital topic that we talk about. But what I'm, so I'm going to say this now, rather, because I'm not going to be here at the end. What, what I find is there's so much pressure against the full manifestation of this ministerial fire. You know, sexuality, power, uh, presence, uh, in individuality, you know, these are also aspects of, of, of sort of the inner quality of inner fire. And, and, and those are not common, uh, commonly agreed on abilities in our society. 
So I'd be curious if you would comment on that sometime. I am glad to, Peter, my dear friend. And in fact, my next slide now is going to go, we're going to jump head first into these waters, these turbulent waters. So let me pull this up one second. And this is a central theme of my uh, new book. And I hope again, it's visible to the group here. Um, so as I said at the beginning, just as um, we have minister of fire and sovereign fire, the sovereign fire in the heart, which is the illumination of consciousness, and the ministerial fire rooted below in the kidneys, in the Ming men between the kidneys. The earth also has ministerial fire. And this is discussed. I uh, was very blessed to get volumes of uh, Paul Unschuld's translation of Li Shi Zhen's Ben Sao Gang Mu. I'll put that in the chat here. Which, uh, Gong which was not only a book of a materia medica of Bun Sao of herbal medicine, was also a book of natural history written during the Ming dynasty by Li Shi Zhen and translated by my dear friend, Paul Unschuld. And in volume two, it is about the medicinal qualities of the five phases water, fire, earth, metal, wood. And I happened to read the introductory section to fire. And he talks about that heaven, humanity, and earth have yin fire and yang fire. So now if we look at this chart, um, we see that there are three yang fires of the earth. Drilling wood, striking stones and tapping metal. These are all ways we can spark fires. Then we have yin fire of heaven, dragon fire and thunderclap fire. Rays of fire are seen in the dragon's mouth. The fire associated with thunderbolts is a divine fire, the heavenly fire. And then the sun and the essence of stars and asteroids is also considered to be heavenly fire. And then we have subclasses of yin and yang, um, yin fire, earth fire, in heaven, earth, and humanity. But here's where my discussion really begins. It's that there are two yin fires of earth generated by petroleum and fire in water. So um, petroleum is a yin fire. In fact, it's mentioned in the Bansao Gangmu as a medicinal petroleum. And it notes that it is a viscous liquid substance that is easily transformed into fire. Um, and the only way you could put this fire, I said that yang fires, let's say if you burn wood, you could pour water on them and the fire goes out. If you try to pour water on a yin fire, it actually flares up. So for example, like with oil wells, gas wells, you can't put them out with water so well. You have to either bury them or use chemical foam or allow them to be exhausted. So it's a unique type of fire. Many of you probably remember the fire in the Mongahela River in Cleveland rivers on fire and sometimes we see bodies of water literally catching fire okay peter have another question go ahead peter let, let peter ask a question here adam yes please do we we just i don't think he didn't i think we weren't able to put his hand back down he's shaking his head no is that right oh. peter okay oh, sorry you. yeah yeah you take your hand down <laughs> Just click on it. So our civilization, one of the main central subjects of this book 
is that we are living in a yin fire civilization. We are burning up not only the jing of the earth, which is a storage of potential life, of yang creative potential that is buried and stored in compressed animal, plant, and mineral material inside the earth. We are liberating it, burning it up in minutes in terms of geological time. Remember, there's celestial time, there's geological time, there's human time. Every organism, every phenomenon in nature has a time. And that can stretch from millions, billions of years to the average 120 year lifespan of a human being to much shorter lifespans for other organisms. So we're talking about using a chi and a substance that has been built up over endless geological time and liberating that in order to power our civilization. And this petroleum, this yin fire is of course, not only oil and gas and coal, it is also plastics. The plastics that is covering now 85% of the surface of the ocean. And that we're dumping millions and millions of tons into the ocean every year. This is petroleum chemistry. A vast majority of all the medications that are used in biomedicine are a result of coal tar chemistry, manipulating molecules. So we are totally dependent on this yin fire, on this petroleum, gas, coal. And here lies political socioeconomic considerations that are huge for humanity because it's not sustainable. And the global warming that we're seeing is liberated. The inside of the earth is actually becoming colder. Of course, not the actual core of the earth per se. Although I've seen scientific articles and we have a guest here today who could probably speak to us on it. Let's see, he's still here. Mark Houston, who's written a lot about these phenomena in his work. And I wanna give him a shout out because he's been a, a major inspiration for me. Um, and he's in Hong Kong. He practices in Hong Kong and has for many, many, many years. But um, we need to find some way to transition ahead to other forms of chi, other forms of energy in the short and long term. And again, I don't have any easy answers for that. I'm simply trying to point out what is we're dealing with in terms of the health of the planet on which we're living. And also we could see that this is no pun intended fueling wars, autocratic societies, it's all based on energy. We talk about petrostates, for example. You know, uh, economies that are based totally on uh, fossil fuels. Okay, so that's basically one of the uh, central themes of the book. And all these charts will be coming as either an ebook or as part of the book itself. I know that the next book, Afterglow is going to be available as a Kindle and an ebook as well as a physical book. So I'm not sure yet if the, all the charts that I'm showing you here will be in the physical book or if you can order them as an ebook. But anyway, if, I have a very associative thinking type of mind. I think in multi layers at the same time, which can either be very useful and creative and sometimes can be a bit chaotic. But I hopefully that this is all very useful for everyone. Thank you so much, Zev. It's, it's just fascinating stuff. This fire and water balance within our human condition and then how those these excellent examples, very pertinent of how that's playing out in our greater world. Let's go, uh, I wanna do two things. Uh, let's go really quick to our other special guest, Dr. Ann Shelton Krut. Uh, and then I want to go and uh, ask a couple questions to our host, Menpa Wangmo. Um, Dr. Kruger, thank you so much for joining us today. So we've been discussing this idea, this fundamental Chinese medicine concept of ministerial fire relating with the balance of fire and water in the human microcosm and the universal macrocosm. Uh, we've also been talking about the, uh, the importance of working with natural time, the season, the uh, cycles of time in terms of human health. So what can you tell us? Do you have anything uh, to add uh, to this in your experience and particularly maybe with your expertise in the cycles of time in the context of Taoist astrology? 
Sure. Let's see, um, I think one of the most important um, things to think about in relation to what Zev just talked about um, that's relevant for people who are interested um, in or practitioners of healthcare and natural medicine, but also just for you know, general lay people is that there is a connection between um, the climate crisis that we're seeing right now in the news every day and outside of our windows <laughs> or inside of our houses when the smoke comes in, at least here in California, um, that this is the same condition that we're treating when we're treating imbalances of ministerial fire. So the way that those concentrated essences, um, the, the, the precious resources of, of coal and oil are being disrupted and thrust out of their appropriate place in the earth. That's what's happening for um, so many modern people now with the, the, the flaring of that concentrated young essence that we want down in the belly doing its job to help us transform and um, warm and nourish and you know, support all of our, of all, all of our metabolic functioning um, and help us feel excited and um, happy and relaxed in our lives and our life expression. That is that concentrated essence that, um, that Jing, that you know, young, consolidated Yang Qi is exactly what is being thrust out of its um, basis, out of its home, and manifesting as what you know we hear, you know, everyone in our community, our patients, if we're practitioners, or our friends, maybe even ourselves, complaining of with these um, things that are so difficult to treat with with modern biomedical uh, medicine, like. You know how many how many people do we know who who have headaches and migraines and um, weird skin rashes and anxiety and insomnia and autoimmune disease and cancers that that you know Western medicine can tell us a lot of very interesting data about but fails to treat in a global way um, that uh, helps us feel really returned back to our center and so that's what's valuable about this topic to me and you know it's it's funny because I. I met um, Zev when I was in my doctoral program, but I discovered his work in my master's program when I was assigned, um, I had to write a paper about some classic text. And um, I knew that, that there was a relationship between the text that I chose and, or potentially a, a, a legend <laughs> that, the, that the classic text that I chose was related in some way to Ayurveda, that maybe it was Ayurvedic um, theory. I, I, had, I, had a I have a background in, Ayurveda, many years of studying classical textual studying time in India, studying that before I got into Chinese medicine. And I was, I had a, a very short classics um, class in my master's degree program and we had to write a paper and I, and I picked this text. No one else was working on this text. And I found Zev's work that way. And I was like, this is, this is the stuff. And I have so many questions. I wish I could ask this guy these questions. <laughs> and then my first day of my, of my doctoral program, um, my first weekend of my doctoral program, not only did I meet Peter who just asked the question, but also Zev, and I was able to ask these questions. <laughs> um, and, you know, these, these topics from the classics are, uh, are, are so relevant to modern disease and they're not really, um, you know, we know that, that Western medicine isn't looking at this global um, picture of health and it's so frustrating for so many people. And, and we know that unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of Chinese medicine um, practitioners aren't taught this stuff in school. You know, we just, I remember being shocked when I saw the board exams because it showed me, when I saw the material for the board exams, it showed me what, um, what people are learning, not just in the schools that I went to, but in all of the Chinese medicine schools. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the, Chinese medicine practitioners are doing their very best to study the classics, but aren't really, um, don't really have access to it as much as I'd like. So that's one of the major, um, that's one of the important things that um, Zev is helping uh, move forward and keep alive in our tradition. And it's also good to know about for, um, for anyone in the audience listening who has these conditions, because now you kind of know a little bit of what to ask for when you're looking in your community for a good practitioner to help you if, if you perhaps feel like you have a, a flaring of your essence, you know, you don't feel grounded and, and rooted in your, in your strength and power. Um, you know, and then of course, the, I think the other thing you asked me about was the relationship to astrology. And, and that's that, yes, it's not only that these, these um, 
mechanisms of health and ways that things go out of balance follow a certain pattern in the environment as well as in our bodies, but it's also related to time. And um, our, our uh, pole star astrology chart is a great way to look at how those cycles of time are, are manifesting um, for the individual, you know? So it's, it's um, all of these, you know, I think everything that we're talking about right now um, has the common denominator of, um, of, of the, of the, of the rhythm of rhythms of patterns of expression in time, externally, internally, you know, microcosm, macrocosm, <laughs> um, these ideas. When we're talking about the health of the earth, we're talking about ourselves and our communities and our, even our politics. When we're talking about our health and when we're talking about, um, you know, it, it just goes both directions all the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Yeah, I, um, it's, it's really uncanny, the connection between, you know, the, what we experience as people with our health today and what we see on the news and what we see in our world, what we see right in our neighborhoods. You know, when we have here in California and the, the West Coast states, when we have these terrible fires, <clears throat> this dry heat and wind um, and toxicity blowing into our towns, and uh, we're dealing with that, I think that many, many people will be able to have a, um, an introspective moment and be like, I kind of feel like this inside too sometimes. I have a dryness, I have toxicity, you know, or when, as Dr. Zev was saying, you know, literally we see the ocean on fire and you'd be like, wow, that is so shocking. But actually I kind of feel like there's gross wet heat erupting that you can't put out well somehow. And so, you know, I think that that connection between our health and the patterns we see, autoimmune, inflammatory, stress, fatigue patterns, and the symptoms we see in our world, I think we can all really connect to that. And this idea of ministerial fire is really an amazing articulation, how we can understand that and work with it. So, and thank you again, Dr. Ann, thanks so much for tuning in um, and say hi to your little guy for us there. So- you know, it, it's the, I'll say, I'll say one, more, one more thing on that if it's okay. Oh. <laughs> Here he is. He's our newest addition <laughs> to the profession. Yeah. <laughs> Oh um, <laughs> yeah so yeah and, and so much of what we're dealing with is so of our time you know um it's uh it's so of our time like when we think about the um the the factionalism and the um and the disparity in in um appreciation of what the real what the baseline reality even is within our country you know and that's, and it seems like such an um, extreme disharmony here, but then you hear about the same thing is happening in, in Russia in its own way, right? The misinformation and debate about what reality is. I'm not commenting on what reality is. I'm just saying the fact that there is such a strong debate about what is even going on. And so this is, this is something, all of this is of its time. And, and um, um, you know, these these issues of failure to communicate um, are happening all over the world, and um, this imbalance is mirrored in our bodies. And so uh, we can learn about that by by studying ministerial fire very closely, you know, to understand that, and and also to not take it so personally <laughs> because it is of its time, you know, and. Um, to understand, to learn about where we are in context of that is our way to get through it, you know, to stay in our hearts and feel our way into our place to be able to see ourselves in that larger context, I think is really the key. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And I th one of the goals of the book, which again, I'm grateful for your help on this, Anne, um, is that it really is should become one of the central concepts in the practice of Chinese medicine for all Chinese medicine practitioners. It's a little more difficult in that there have been different schools of thought on ministerial fire itself, different interpretations. There have been ongoing debates over the centuries and context is everything in Chinese medicine. And I think we're so used in the West to this, um, again, 
I believe in science, but there's different types of science. There are cultural uh, uh, determinations of science. Like um, the philosophy of the East is somewhat different than philosophy in the West that, that's behind science. But the idea that there's one truth, one way of seeing things, there's absolute fact in Chinese medicine is a much more slippery relative aspect. You can have theories that appear to be contradictory side by side with each other. And we see these debates in the work of such physicians, Zhang Jingyue, who took issue with Li Dongyuan and Zhu Danxi's uh, uh, view of ministerial fire. And I'm sure there are people right here in our group who have studied ministerial fire also may have different views than what I'm putting out here. So it's not an absolutist view, but nonetheless, it is very, very important that we understand this. And the rising in the 20th century of the uh, fire spirit school, the Huo Shenpai, the importance of maintaining that kindling, that ministerial fire in the belly in order to maintain human health is also a very important thing right now because we're seeing a lot of people's fires going out or their fires being more commonly displaced. So where they're constantly agitated, ah, right? So. These are things we have to work with clinically and practically on a medical scale, on a personal scale, in terms of young shen nourishing our own health, and on a worldly scale, we have to deal with this. So Zev, on that note, I think our audience would appreciate if you spend uh, just a few minutes ta talking uh, about some of the practical solutions, how we can affect to nourish our health uh, with lifestyle and diet and daily life. Will you take about, you know, up to maybe 10 minutes or so before we start our Q&A and just tell us a little bit about what can we do about it? How do we protect our source chi? How do we nourish life? How do we uh, do the right lifestyle to harmonize our ministerial fire these days? There's so many uh, aspects to that. Um, I would start with the, the smoothie juicy crowd. <laughs> Starting your day with an ice cold beverage, whether it's blended or, you know, juices as you hit the gym. Okay, you may burn it up, but if you keep drinking iced or cold drinks, eating cold foods, you're going to put out your digestive fire. You're going to put out your ministerial fire at some point. You know, burn out. What are you burning out? You're burning out your ministerial fire. And when you burn out, it floats and it agitates you. It doesn't completely disappear. If ministerial fire completely disappears, you die. So there's also what Zhang Jingyue spoke about in his writings. And there's a translation of his work put out by Purple Cloud Press, which I highly recommend. And he says that the fire of the emotions consumes ministerial fire. It's like it agitates. So balanced emotions. And there's a whole segment of the population and maybe a, a large segment of the population that are constantly being agitated by news, disinformation, as Anne mentioned. And it's addictive because um, this is what Lee Dong Yuan had to say about it. He said that um, stirring the ministerial fire comes from overstimulation of the emotions. And that includes like the constant chasing of um, gratification. So some people get off on uh, getting angry, angry, angry at the world, angry, angry over and over again. You read the news in the morning, oh, I'm really, oh, this is really bad, you know? And turn on the TV and oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh you're constantly lifting up your ministerial fire. You're firing up your emotions, your heart rate, your brain. And then afterwards you go back down to a semi-depressed, cold kind of state because you just consumed more ministerial fire without feeding its source in the lower burner. So this is why all the Asian meditative traditions emphasize, you know, like in Zen meditation, in the Hara, in the Dantian, in Taoism, to keep the center below the navel rather than letting always flooding up into the head and stirring the mind and the thinking, and the, which also consumes a lot of jing as well as ministerial fire and a lot of the blood. The blood 
uh, is more consumed by the brain than any organ during physical exercise or normal functioning. So in, in pre-Han dynasty medicine, the viscera, we call it the zong in Chinese medicine, were called the storehouses of qi and emotion. So emotions were considered a qi aspect of internal organs. So um, we have to guard them too as a form of essence. Yes. One doesn't have to be a stone. We are emotional beings as well as intellectual and physical beings and spiritual beings. But managing those emotions is very important. And I learned something important uh, a number of years ago. Um, so I'm in a certain age group and now, well, thank God my health is excellent and I feel great in my late 60s. But I have learned that I cannot let my emotions get the best of me in terms of getting upset or angry because my heart rate will suddenly speed up. And when you do that, that's a sign that you're drawing your ministerial fire up into your chest. So there's certain, uh, shall we say, certain discussions, debates on places like Facebook that I now assiduously avoid taking part in. Not that I ever thought that, that you can get any result in being in those debates. So it says in the Talmud that any debate that is for the sake of heaven will prevail. Any debate that is not for the sake of heaven will not. So if both parties who are discussing or debating something have in mind truthfulness, healing, and an end result that is positive, it will survive. If it is done for the sake of ego gratification or the feeling good of stirring your ministerial fire, it will not prevail. So you have the emotional aspect, you have the dietary aspect where we need to eat warm foods that nourish the center, the spleen chi, and nourish the ministerial fire. So this is why traditional cultures, especially interestingly enough, and uh, who live in warm climates use warming spicy foods because so much ministerial fire is lost through the process of expelling excessive heat through sweating. So in the, the, gen, the gentle use of warming medicinals such as uh, uh, shengjiang, fresh ginger, which we can use in culinary pursuits, um, cardamom, sharen, or, or cao guo, um, asafoetida that's used in Persian medicine, which is a very warming, bitter spice herb. Um, and of course, uh, guajir and rogue, cinnamon, and our very special herb, futsa. I used to be able to get a pu'er tea made with futsa. It was a real treasure, a real classic. And unfortunately, I used to get wow. to your own who, uh, studied with teachers in the Hoshenpai, the uh, fire spirit school. And I'm not saying that every condition needs to be treated with aconite or ginger um, or rogue cinnamon bark, but that um, definitely this is an aspect of medicine we should not be afraid of using in medicine. In terms of our food, make sure we have cooked warming foods, to strengthen the lower burner. I personally have been practicing what used to be called macrobiotic diet with, um, for over 50 years now, which is uh, whole grains, vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, seasonal foods, local as much as possible, use of fermented foods, miso, sauerkraut, pickled vegetables, and small amounts of animal food, in, the, in my case, the form of fish. So, and of course, as throughout my last 50 years, I've changed the diet to match the age group that I'm in. Like now I eat much less than I used to. I can't burn up as much food and I eat earlier at night, you know, allowing enough time for digestion before going to sleep. You know, most of us know these health rules and hopefully most of us practice them and we teach them to our patients. The famous early 20th century physician, Zhang Shichun, said the purpose of practicing Chinese medicine is to teach the principles of medicine to our patients. In other words, herbal medicine and acupuncture moxibustion are teaching school tools to teach our patients how, as he says, to manage 
their own chi hua, their own chi transformation. And you need ministerial fire to transform. You transform food into self. You separate clear and turbid. It's all about chi transformation, which has something in common with what in modern medicine would be called metabolism. But there are many different metabolisms. And modern concepts such as metabolism and, of course, microbiomes of the body are helpful tools in this understanding as well. Okay, so that's about 10 minutes worth, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Excellent. Well, uh, so now I think we have some time and we should take some questions uh, from our audience here and this fascinating topic. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, so let's see if anybody uh, has a question or a comment for Dr. Zev, then please do just raise your hand and uh, keep in mind, we'll have you unmute and you will be live on camera. So 